But we have to pass the bill so that you can uh, find out what is in it away from the fog of the controversy. If you go to H.R. 3962, uh, this is a bill that was written back in uh, 2009, October 29, 2009. If you go down to page, uh, I think maybe 1501, uh, this is the FDA administration. And then if you scroll down a little bit more, it talks about National Medical Device Registry. And if you read down, it talks about implementing a, uh, and it talks about class three medical devices and it's like uh, pacemakers and stuff. But this right here, it says, and this is a very open-ended bill. It means they can do whatever they want and have vague language. But it says, uh, may include, as the secretary uh, determines, uh, as she deems appropriate, uh, and specifies in regulation, a class two device that is life supporting or life sustaining. What is a class two device? Well, if you go to the FDA, a class two special controls guidance document, implantable radio frequency, fre frequency transponder, system for patent identification and health information. If you go back here, it's all about data registry, medical device registry, health information, implantable. If you go over here to FDA, class two, implantable radio frequency frequency transponder system for for patient identification and health information for medical device registry and also over here it talks about it uh it goes through uh this talks about the class two the device is intended to enable access to secure patient identification and corresponding health information in humans implantable what are they talking about they're talking about the microchip. All right, this next story may sound like something out of, uh, well, a Hollywood thriller. A Saudi inventor has created a killer microchip. It's designed to track terrorists and criminals and, well, you can think of somebody. Not only does it include a GPS device, it also has a lethal dose of cyanide, which can be activated at any time. You get my point? Now, they tried to pass a bill like this a couple of years ago, and I think uh, the whistleblowers came out. So they came out and uh, redacted part of a bill, and they've come out with this very vague one. Now, what was in the other bill? Uh, this was H.R. 3200. Same uh, wording, a Class two device that is implantable. This was in their thing. Life-supporting, life-sustaining. The same thing is what they put here, but they've worded it uh, vague. Class two device, they've taken out implantable, that is life supporting and life sustaining. They, even though it's vague, it still means the same thing as a class two device that is implantable. This was in their actual bill. And when, and when you go back, what is implantable? It goes back to the chip. And I think one reason why they took uh, the thing out of the bill and has made it vague is because a couple years ago, uh, Ron Paul came out and he said buried deep within over a thousand pages of this massive U.S. health care bill uh, in a non-discussed section titled uh, C-11, Section 2521, this is H.R. 3200, National Medical Device Registry, in which states its purpose as, he quotes, that part of the law and then goes on to say, in a real world speak, according to this report, this new law, when finally implemented, provides the framework for making the, the United States the first nation in the world to require each and every one of its citizen, citizens to have implanted in them a radio frequency identification microchip for the purpose of controlling who is or isn't allowed medical care in their country. They have been talking about the, uh, the microchip for a while and it's getting closer and closer to them wanting to implement it. And now that Obamacare has passed, they wanted to establish a nat uh, national medical device registry uh, as the secretary uh, deems appropriate, a class two device that is life supporting, class two device, class two device, implantable, class two device. Now, 
this is a slide from an industry consortium called the Auto ID Center that wants to promote the use of these tiny uh, tracking devices, the RFID tags, for a variety of different reasons. Uh, perhaps the most disturbing of them, uh, in addition to counting humans, would be to count and number every item on the planet and use it to replace the barcode. So physical items could actually be identified and numbered and linked from a distance and tracked. Now, one of the things on this slide that they talk about is it would take 23 bits, that's, a, that's the numerical information it would have to contain in that tiny speck of dust sized chip to number every automobile on the planet. It would take 29 bits or zeros and ones, a string of 29 zeros and ones to number all the computers. And here's the creepy part, it would only take 33 zeros and ones to give a unique identifying number to every human being on the planet. So 001011, do that 33 times, and you've got a unique number for everyone. Now, the disturbing part here is that this industry consortium, which consists of some of the biggest global companies in the world, including um, Procter & Gamble, including Johnson & Johnson, Kimberly Clark, International Paper, big companies, Coca-Cola, these guys should be thinking about products, and yet on here they're naming human beings. So this technology with all of this backing, by the way, the Department of Defense and the U.S. Postal Service are also backers of this technology. Uh, the fact that they're putting human beings on their, on their slides and their internal documents as a way to uh, utilize this technology is a little bit worrisome. And definitely by putting one of these numbers into one of these Vera chips and implanting it into a human being, you could verify them. You could have a number associated with them. You could link that number up to a database, and you could require them to present that in order to buy or sell for the reasons that we talked about. The company producing these chips is a company called Alien Technology, and you can't really see it very well, but it's got, I think, one of the creepiest logos I've ever seen. Uh, it's black, it's got uh, red on a black background, it has what looks like almost three claw marks sort of screeching across the screen. And in fact, most of the imagery associated with this technology is quite dark. Um, at, at a conference I attended last, a couple, about two months ago, there was a gentleman from uh, Philip Morris talking about this technology. He was talking to a bunch of global um, uh, executives from global companies who deal with moving products around. And he was telling them, you know, when this, when this comes out, when we have radio devices and everything, when we're tracking everything all over the planet, you're going to need to really change the way you run your warehouse in your back room. And do you know what he said? And he meant this in terms of you're going to have to totally change the way you do business and revolutionize your, your thinking about moving products. But his statement was this technology will destroy our way of life. The purpose of this technology is to destroy our way of life. Now, it's interesting because in his saying that, the whole room went silent. By the way, these are people who love the idea of tracking things as they move around. But even then, the room went silent because that was a pretty heavy statement. And I don't think he meant that it's going to absolutely destroy our way of life as we live day to day. But I also don't think he realized the symbolic importance of what he had said. Because if we do actually number every human being, and if we do number every physical item, and if we can keep track of all of that through databases and through computer systems, it will actually destroy our way of life. There will be no more freedom. There will be no more privacy or no more ability to walk around uh, and, and even talk to other people freely because your every move will be monitored and tracked. All right, there's the chips. And these devices, as I said, this industry consortium, they've already begun appearing, these radio frequency devices, in consumer products. What you're seeing here is a package of Gillette razor blades that's been equipped with one of these unique numbers, making it trackable from a distance. The purpose here was shoplifting prevention, but ultimately they want to put one of these on every physical item that we buy, meaning that not only would you be identifying yourself with your chip as you made your purchase, but all of the things you bought would also be identified with you, linked in a database. And in, in essence, it would, be, it would make it difficult in a world where, let's say, there is the mark of the beast. And you've got a brother-in-law who is maybe willing to take the mark of the beast and give you the stuff that he buys so you can survive. In a world like that, if he bought a shirt, paid for it with his mark, and then handed it to you, that shirt could be tracked at a distance. It could be identified as you walk through a doorway. And they could say, hey, wait a minute, you're not Joe Schmo. You don't have the chip in here. You're not this. In fact, now we've identified you as being the guy who's in trouble for not taking the chip. And now we're going to scan everything you're wearing, and we'll know where you got it. And we'll know who your accomplices were who helped you obtain these items.
All right. Now, one of the things that's going to have to happen globally, in addition to identifying everyone, linking everyone with the satellites and the database and the number payment systems, getting everybody using credit cards away from cash and getting everyone to identify themselves, is have it be universal and standardized. And there is a massive push right now in industry and in retail to do that. It's called oneness. And in fact, at the, uh, this is from the Retail Systems 2003 in Chicago, creating oneness among systems, supply chain, and business. And the idea is that everything will be standardized. The whole agenda is to create a one world government where everybody has an, R R an RFID chip implanted in them. All money is to be um, in those chips, right? There'll be no more cash. And this is giving me straight from Rockefeller himself. This is what they want to accomplish. And all money will be in your chips. And so, any, so not, instead of having cash, Anytime you have money in your, in, your, in your chip, they can take out whatever they want to take out whenever they want to. If they say you owe us this much money in taxes, they just deduct it out of your chip digitally. Total control. Total control. And if you're like me or you, and you're protesting what they're doing, they can just turn off your chip. And you have nothing. You can't buy food. You can't do anything. It's total control of the people. And that chip's connected to a database that has your purchasing records, what you do, what everything, you sell. everything is in there, you know. And so they they want a one world government, controlled by them, everybody being chipped, all your money in those chips, and they control the chips and they control the people. And you become a slave. You become a serf to these people. That's their goal. That's their intentions. Machine interfaces, a technology that marks the beginnings of a new kind of man, the cyborg, the robot man. Neuro robotic technology can be applied in different directions the brain controlling the machine, or inversely, the machine controlling the brain. So we're just going to go through each one of these arms one, two, three, four, five, six. And just do all of those and help us do it. But a third option is also possible. One brain controlling another brain via the interface. How does this work in the case of the robot rat? All you need, in fact, are three well-positioned electrodes. Two electrodes in the sensory cortex of the rat send stimuli to the zones connected to its whiskers. When the rat follows the signal sent to its left side and turns in that direction, it is rewarded with a discharge into its pleasure zone. It is rewarded with a discharge into its pleasure zone. This discharge produces a flow of dopamine, providing instant pleasure. This zone is also called the brain's reward center. We possess a reward center too. We possess a reward center too, just like the rat. In the process of creating a cyborg, this is square one. If we send a stimulus to the zone related to the hand, we create a sensation in that area. In the same way, via the motor cortex, we can provoke an involuntary movement. We can provoke an involuntary movement. In Boston, the first machine-brain interface trials have already been conducted on paraplegic patients. Thanks to an electrode chip called the brain gate, they can operate a computer remotely by thought. So it's no coincidence that these researches are partly funded by DARPA, the U.S.'s defense research agency. Neuroscience will bring us the soldier of the future.
This is a new deal, gentlemen. Enemy center of gravity is downtown. Should get a good view from here. A remote controlled soldier? A soldier who, in the midst of the battle, can be sent crucial data and information downloaded into his brain? A soldier who can control his fears? That's mean. That was mean, Matari. Dude, look at we people all in there. <laughs> dude, those two people. You see who pulled up in the white car? I shot that dude in the white car, ran in. Oh yes, you're gonna get it. Yes, naughty little boys. <laughs> yes. 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 We possess a reward center too, just like the rat. If we send a stimulus to the zone related to the hand, we create a sensation in that area. In the same way, via the motor cortex, we can provoke an involuntary movement. <laughs> you little <laughs> shoot it us! You little <laughs> die! going to reach a level of control. The more we learn about the brain, the more researchers discover how little our consciousness and will control our choices and behaviors. And each and every one of you watching this, every single one of you, is just as important as the people who were our founding fathers as that you are just as important as the sons of liberty who met in the 1770s to to philosophize about freedom to philosophize about a republic to philosophize about a truly free country with a republic there's a billion people on the planet it only take one to change it are you the one there may be everybody in your classroom bugging out. Your whole school may be on fire with kids wild and bringing guns at, but are you the one? Nature has a way of abundance. Nature puts out a lot of stuff looking for the one. So if you're going to go along with the trend of let's just kill each other, let's disrespect each other, then you're part of nature's plan as well to be part of just the, 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 the excess. But if you think more of yourself than just being the excess, you'll do more for yourself. Are you the one? Everybody's not gonna make it. But you have an opportunity to save yourself. Well, we don't have to look back thousands or even hundreds of years to see how dangerous this present day situation is. We can look back to Bolshevik Russia. We can see the takeover by the Bolsheviks talking about the people's revolution, talking about the positive change. And Lenin came in and then Stalin. The fact is, is that over 40 million Russians between 1925 and 1940, good Russian, people who were Christians, people who had, who had their own businesses, people who were educated, they were exterminated because they had their own business, because they were educated, because they believed, believed in God's law. We can look over at Germany. 
Germany was in a very, very terrible economic situation. And this very charismatic leader called Adolf Hitler comes in. He, he, he makes the roads good and he promises a better life for the people. And within 10 years, you see a completely nationalized, centralized, dictatorial situation where millions and millions of people were exterminated. And then we can go to Maoist China. Mao came in, he, he promised change, he promised a better life. And within five years, 60 million Chinese were exterminated. They don't teach that. They don't teach that in the schools these days. And it wasn't that long ago. And I pray, pray, pray to God that this will not happen in the United States. And the way it won't happen is if you and your friends and all of us together take action to say no. This country is too precious. It's too wonderful. It's, it's too good of a place to lay down as a victim. This is the center of endurance. And endurance is what wins wars. Not how many people you kill, but how long can you endure? George Washington lost almost every battle he had, but he endured. He out endured the British. And that's how the battle was won, endurance. Greatness could arise once we break the shackles of the government that's holding us back. One thing America has more than any other country is an entrepreneurial spirit. One thing we have more than any other country is the ability to be innovators. As political activist Mario Savio said, There's a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart, that you can't take part. You can't even passively take part. And you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers, upon all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop. And you've got to indicate to the people who run it, to the people who own it, that unless you're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. Humankind is at a historic crossroads. The forces of globalism are marching towards absolute despotism. Look in the mirror, count the cost, and decide, are you going to let history repeat itself? Or will you stand tall with freedom lovers everywhere and stop the completion of a world dictatorship?